Welcome back everyone. This time we're going to dive into the code behind. So for this tutorial, I am still working off of a fresh project, so you don't need to have any logic to get started. The first thing I want to talk about is the ability to access and manipulate your UI elements from the code behind. So let's start with another text block like we did before. So let's add a text block. Let's say text equals hello world. Let's make our font size big enough to where we can read it. And that's good enough. Save that. Now let's go to our code behind. So we have our constructor and this initializes our UI. But if we ran our code, how would we manipulate this text block on the form? There are several ways to do this. One is called data binding, which is a cool WPF feature but we're going to use the simplest way for now so we can get a better understanding, and that is accessing the control by its name. So if we go into our text block and add a name property, you might notice that name and name x both show up. You can use either one. You really only need name x if the name property is ambiguous, and that's because that this property name is specific to this text block control, whereas name x is a little bit lower level of a concept. So we'll use name and we'll call it TB for text block and we'll call it hello. TB hello. Save that. We'll go back over to our code behind and now we can access our control simply by writing its name. So TB hello, we put a period and we'll have access to all of its properties. So just like in the XAML, it's going to have a text property. So if we scroll down, you can see text alignment, you could set all of its properties directly. So we'll say text equals hello world two. So now if we save and run this, instead of it saying hello world, our constructor will run and set the text to hello world two. And there it is. Now there are many reasons you would need to set these sort of properties from the code behind. And that's because you don't always know at design time what you need your UI to be displaying. Maybe your text needs to change or change color or disappear. And that would depend on what state your application is in. So you need to be able to control all of these elements depending on what's happening in the code and then have them respond on the UI. So now we know how to manipulate a UI element from the code, but we also need to be able to make something happen in the code when a UI element is manipulated. So let's do an example so I can show you what I mean. So let's create a button. Let's go ahead and give it a name. We'll call it btn run. Let's make it a hundred pixels wide and let's make it 50 pixels tall. And let's say we want to center it to vertical center, horizontal center, and let's close our tag. So now we have a button right in the middle of our page. Let's put the content on it and say run. Content is the word that displays inside of the button. I'm going to put an enter in here to make this a little bit better formatted. As long as your tags have an open and close, you can put white space in all you like. So then I'm actually going to make the font size of this button just a little bit bigger, maybe 20, so we can see our run button a little bit better. So now if we run, our form now has a button and a label. So what we already know how to do is go to the code behind, manipulate our button. So we can say button run dot content equals stop. And it will start out being run. The constructor will run and change this content to stop. So when we run our program, our button's content is stop. But what we need to be able to do is take some action when this button is actually clicked, not just manipulate the button from the code behind, but do something in the code behind when this button is pressed. To do that, we need to do what is called subscribing to an event. So if you're in one of your UI elements, like a button, and you push a letter and your IntelliSense menu comes up, you can see these little icons. Properties are wrenches. So things like content, and font size are these wrench properties that you set here. But there are also these lightning bolts and those represent events and click is exactly what we want. 
but there are tons of events, context menu events, closing events, mouse over events, drag and drop, all kinds of things. But what we want is click. So we will add a click event and what it will automatically do for you is let you create a new event handler. So if we double click that, it's going to create button run, which is the name of our button, underscore click. So that's the naming convention that it uses automatically. And now if we go to our code behind, you'll see that it has automatically generated what is called an event handler. So what we have done is we have created a method in our code behind that takes a generic object sender, which is where the event is coming from, and routed event arguments, which is a set of arguments that comes from a routed event, which is the type of event coming from our UI. And then in the UI, we're saying, okay, when this button is clicked, we are going to execute this event handler. So immediately when the button is clicked, we are going to enter this code block. So we can quickly see this happen with our debugger, go to breakpoint and run. And when we click our button, it will jump into the code block and we can take a peek at these arguments and you can see that the sender is the button. And then depending on the control and the event type, it can give you some additional argument information, like if the event has been handled, where it came from, certain things that have changed, all kind of useful information to know what to do when you receive an event from your UI. So now that we know how to manipulate the UI from the code and how to fire some event from the UI in the code, let's do a real example. So let's go ahead and remove both of these from our constructor. Let's go back to our UI and let's remove the text from our text block. So the text block still exists, it just doesn't have any text in it. So when we run our application, we just have a run button. Now, when the run button is clicked, let's set our TB hello text block dot text to running. And let's also update a Boolean. So let's say bool running equals false. And if our run button is clicked, let's say running equals true. And we can run this. And when we push our run button, our text is set to running. So let's take this one step further for the sake of examples. And instead of this only being able to run, let's also make it be able to stop. So let's go back to our code. I'm going to rename TB hello to TB status because naming is just, it's so important. So I'm going to change that there as well. And now let's change our button run to button toggle run. And let's go ahead and update our click method name. And then since we did that, we have to go update our actual method name. So now we have a button that begins as a run button, but is really a toggle button. And then we have a status label. So now what we want to do is use our Boolean to be able to toggle between run and stop. So let's make an if statement for our Boolean. And we'll say if running, we want to do something else we want to do something else. So you have to remember when this event is entered, it's because the button was pressed. So if we are already running when the button is pressed, that means we want to stop. And if we are not running when the button is pressed, that means we want to run. So this is where we would fire off any actual stop and run logic, but since we don't have that, let's just update the UI like we do. So we need to set our status in both places. If we're stopping, then we're going to set this to stop. And if we're running, we're going to set it to running. And also what we need to do is we need to set our button.toggleruns content to be able to run it again. So we're stopping it, which means the next click should be a run action. And if we are running, that means we need to be able to stop it. So now, instead of setting running equals true, what we need to do is flip our Boolean. We could put running equals false in here and running equals true in here, but we could just do it in one line where we set running equals to not running, which is basically going to say, if it's true, make it false. If it's false, make it true. Because it's a toggle button, this will work every time. So let's fire this up. So our basic starting state, 
the label is blank, the button is run. If we press the run button, we are running. Our button changes to stop. If we press stop, we go to stopped and our button goes back to run. And then we can toggle it over and over and over. Now, of course, if this were a real application, you would need to make sure your run action or your stop action actually happened before you update the UI so you can know what state you're actually in. But you get the idea as far as the UI code goes, how to make that happen. Now that is, in a nutshell, how to go from UI to code and code to UI. Now, like I said before, there are some practices and design patterns like MVVM using data bindings that will make your code better. But as far as learning WPF and how to create a UI in WPF, this is a great start. Next up, we're going to get familiar with the grid control and start making some basic layouts for our applications. So thanks for watching, everybody. I do appreciate you. Happy coding, and until next time, as always, take care.